Please turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. We're continuing our series, which we began last week through Paul's letter to the Thessalonian believers, and he will write in this passage about the transforming power of the gospel. And even though this was written 2,000 years ago, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's written to us, each one of us today. God has a message for you from his word. Let me read 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 7. The word of God says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that the gospel is your power for salvation. We know that the eyes of every person's heart were were blinded to Christ. We we couldn't see Christ. Our hearts were so proud. No one would ever believe in you except for the power of the gospel. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the, the gospel. Thank you that someone for each person here shared the gospel with us. And then your spirit powerfully worked. You you opened our eyes so that we could see you, Christ. You gave us faith so that we could repent and and believe. You transformed us from the inside out. But we humbly acknowledge, Lord, that we need a continual transformation. We need your gospel to continue to work in our lives. We long to be complete in Christ. We need your gospel, Christ. We need the constant reminder of the power of your death for us. Give us hope. Give each person here hope, even in the face of stubborn sin, that you would give hope. You give hope. I pray, Holy Spirit, that right now, even as we have just sung, that you would empower your word, that your word would pierce deeply in our hearts, that we would see Christ, that you give us hope for change, and that we can grow in Christ-likeness. Speak, O Lord, we ask by your grace and for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. It's been said that people don't change, only their costumes do. But we have whole industries in our society that are dedicated to to changing people. Billions of dollars invested in various ways trying to change people, whether it's dieting or drinking or drugs or or many other things that, that people are wanting to change, and yet there seems to be very little success. Can people really change? Not just on the surface, but but deep down. Not just on the surface for appearances, but can people change in the depths of their character? Can you change? Can you change? Now, there's certainly areas of your life where you would like to change, and yet does it seem like you're having very limited success in those areas? Beloved, we need to be reminded again of the life-changing power of the gospel. Yes, the gospel to save us, but also the life-changing power of the gospel to change us in those areas that we continue to struggle with. If you're a Christian, the good news of the gospel is working in your life for God's glory and your good. Do you believe in the transforming power of the gospel? And we will see in this passage that, like the Thessalonians, you can be an example. Like the Thessalonians, you can be an example by God's grace for others to follow as you seek God. Paul's going to remind the Thessalonian believers here how the gospel came to them. He's going to remind them of the powerful effect the gospel had and how it's continuing to work in their lives. And we will see the simple message of this passage is the call to trust the gospel's transforming power. To trust the gospel's transforming power at salvation, but beyond that, in every day of our life. We will see in this passage first the power of the gospel. 
Then we will see the power of suffering, and finally we will see the power of example. Let's look first of all at the the power of the gospel in verse 5. Look there, Paul says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. This word gospel is a a compound from two Greek words. The one, the first means good, and the second means message. So in a sense, this word gospel has the idea of good message. Sometimes we would call it the good news because that's what the word means. And Paul says here that the gospel is more than words. Now, the gospel does start with words because the gospel, the good news, is based on clear truths that must be declared. There is truth. It's not just words, but there are words of truth. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, or by a word about Christ. No one can come to Christ just by watching a Christian's life as good as it may be. 1 Peter 1, 23 says, For you have been born again. How were you born again? Not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. How is it? That is through the living and enduring word of God. Without gospel words, people won't understand your life. They won't understand what's behind your Christ-like life. Now, Paul certainly lived the gospel. We'll see that in this passage. But there was always a clear proclamation of of gospel truth, of gospel words. If you remember, we read last week, Acts 17, 1 to 10, because it's in Acts 17 that we have the background. It, It explains to us how the church was planted there in Thessalonica. And in verses 2 to 3 of Acts 17, Paul summarizes what were the words of the gospel that he shared? What was that gospel message? And he says, and according to Paul's custom, he went to them. And for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. So what did he say? What did he say? What were the words that Paul said explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus who I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ. In many ways, that's kind of the the gospel in, in summary. Jesus Christ had to suffer. Jesus Christ had to die in your place. He had to rise again for sinners so that we could be reconciled to God. Those are the words of the gospel, the truth. And really, there's, there's four very simple but very profound aspects of what the Scripture would call the gospel. If you were to say, well, what is the gospel? It's not just using the word gospel, gospel, gospel. No, it's, it's what does it mean? What does it contain? There's four basic truths. And the first one would be that God is holy. God is holy. The gospel doesn't start with you. The gospel starts with God. God is holy and righteous. But then secondly, the second part of the gospel, it's the opposite side, and that is people are sinful. People are sinful. People are sinful. The third is that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Christ came as Lord and Savior through his death and resurrection. He is Lord and Savior. And then the final aspect of the gospel is that we must believe and repent. We must believe and repent. God is holy. People are sinful. Jesus is Lord and Savior, and we must believe and repent. This was the gospel that Paul proclaimed. This is the gospel. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, that would summarize what you had to be exposed to and what you had to respond to. This is what a person must hear or read and understand and believe if a person is to be reconciled to God. God is holy. The the gospel starts with God, holy and righteous. God is of pure eyes to look on iniquity. You are sinful. Your sin separates you from a holy God. And God solved this problem in the most amazing way by sending his son as Lord and Savior to die on the cross, to take your sin upon him, and then to resurrect from the dead to show that God had received that payment. 
He suffered the wrath of God you deserved. But all of that, God's holiness, man's sinfulness, Christ dying for sinners, all of that does no good if a person doesn't believe. They must believe. They must repent. They must trust in Christ's death for them. So that's the summary. These are the gospel words. This is what Paul proclaimed. Paul proclaimed the word of the gospel. And yet in the passage we're looking at right here, he specifically says, our gospel did not come to you in word only. Yes, it did come in word. It came with powerful words of the gospel. But it didn't stop there. Paul's message didn't stop there. Are gospel words enough? If someone hears or reads the words of the gospel, will they automatically receive Christ in faith and repentance? There was a recent Rasmussen National Survey that found that 77% of American adults would say that they believe in Jesus Christ. He was the Son of God sent to earth to die for our sins. They believe in those words of the gospel. That could be some here, that you believe in those words. Many people are aware of, many people even acknowledge the facts of the gospel, but they are not saved. They do not know Christ in a personal way. Well, why? Look at verse 5. He tells us why. For our gospel did not come to you in word only. It came in word, but not in word only. Look at the next phrase. But also in power and in the Holy Spirit. There must be gospel words, but talk won't do it alone. Even talking about the truths of the gospel, by God's grace, divine power must be woven through the words of the gospel so that someone will come to Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 through 5, Paul says there, And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but what? but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men or on the words of men, but would rest on what? The power of God. This is stunning. If anyone's words could have saved someone, it would have been the Apostle Paul. And yet he says that, no, my words, even as a big A apostle, his words alone could not win anyone to Christ. So yes, we need to be prepared with the words, right? We need to be prepared to share the the words of the gospel. But ultimately, it's God's power that we depend on, that his his power would work. Gospel words must be infused with divine power. You say, well, what is that? What is the power that Paul is talking about here? Look there in the middle of verse 5. Our gospel does not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. You notice what he couples this with so that you understand what this power is. This power, it's not just some kind of ethereal, mystical, fuzzy, nondescript influence. He, He tells you right in this verse what it is. And throughout the book of Acts and Paul's writings, it's very clear that this power behind the gospel is the person and work of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. It says right in the text. Well, Christ said this in Acts 1.8. Remember when he said, you will receive power. There's the power. How? You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. The first century Christians, the apostles, were very faithful proclaimers of the gospel. Very clear. But that doesn't explain alone, or even primarily, why and how people responded to their message. What was it? There's only one explanation. The Holy Spirit, the person and work of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, empowered their words with divine authority and power so that completely transformed the lives of people that they were proclaiming the gospel to. Say, why is that so necessary? Why is that so necessary? Why do we need that divine power as we share the gospel? Why is that so necessary? You say, well, I share the gospel. It's obvious. Come on. 
The gospel is obvious. I just shared with you the four points of the the gospel. Yes, that is obvious, but it's not to sinners. Why do we need the power of the Spirit to work? Why will no one ever come to Christ in saving faith without the intervening work of the Holy Spirit? 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, Paul tells us why this power of the Spirit is so needed. He says, and even if our gospel, there's the good news, there's the words, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel, the good news of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. That's it. That's why there is such a need for the power of the Holy Spirit to work through those gospel words. The gospel seems so obvious to us, doesn't it? At this end of salvation, on the other end of salvation, it's obvious. And yet think around about the unbelievers around you who just don't get it. They can't see what is, seems to be so obvious to, to them. The, the gospel may seem, it just seems foolish. It seems untrue. It seems irrational. It may even be blinding. The Satan may even be blinding them in the sense that they intellectually will acknowledge it And yet he's blinded them so much that they do not submit their lives to Christ. They will not come to him in faith and repentance. They will acknowledge that Jesus exists. They may even say, yes, Jesus died on the cross for sins, and yet their minds are blinded. They cannot have true saving faith because of what Satan has done. He's blinded. He confused their minds to the life-changing truths of the gospel. I'm I'm sure it's happened to you. Maybe you've shared very carefully the gospel, the good news. You've, you've given good explanation. You've, you've shared scripture very clearly, and yet they just don't get it. Why? Because by God's grace, the Spirit of God has to take those gospel words and remove the blinders so that, that person can see Christ, so they can see the reality of the gospel. And when the power of the Spirit works, what happens? It's irresistible. It's irresistible. When he removes the blinders, it's irresistible. When their blinders are removed by the power of the Spirit of God, when they see Christ for who he is, when they see what he has done and what they need, that person will come to him in saving faith. That's what the power of the Spirit of God does. And the power of the Spirit of God, it's not limited to to missionaries or pastors or elders or or some other special category of Christians. No. What is it? In a simple but profound way, this power describes the Holy Spirit energizing and empowering the proclamation of the good news, of the gospel, no matter who it is, no matter what Christian humbly shares that, the Spirit of God can empower that for his glory. So, beloved, that's the power that infuses the gospel. Romans 1.16, Paul says, for, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. When you share the gospel, beloved, When you share, when you speak out the good news of the gospel, it's unlike anything else you will ever speak. The Spirit of God can infuse the words of gospel truth that you speak with power, with power. And this is amazing. And it helps us to realize that ultimately, ultimately it's not dependent on you. Yes, you long for that loved one to come to Christ You long for that neighbor or that child to see the reality of who Christ is. You long, you pray for that. You seek to share the gospel imperfectly, and yet you boldly share the gospel. Ultimately, though, it's the power of the Spirit of God that saves. That ultimately is what we are dependent upon. For your neighbor, for your loved one, for your child. Yes, share the gospel, but realize and pray that God would do a work that. And what happens when that 
Gospel words are connected with divine power of the Spirit. What happens? Look there in the passage. It tells you. And with full conviction. There's conviction. The Spirit empowered gospel proclamation. What did happen in the Thessalonian believers' lives? It brought a pride-shattering, heart-transforming, life-changing conviction into their lives of the Thessalonians. That they responded because of this power. And although we share the gospel with sincerity, and although you share the gospel with earnestness, ultimately you are not the Holy Spirit. You can't, you can't bring this kind of conviction, no matter how passionately you share the gospel. And be careful. You don't go too far in that, because ultimately it's the Holy Spirit that's going to have to do that. He's going to have to empower that gospel truth. And we humbly pray that God would use his message to, to pierce those hearts so they would see Christ, so they would respond to Christ in saving faith. So what are implications from this, this first section of the power of the gospel? I think a, a first one, Christian, is that you need to know the gospel. If you're a Christian, you need to, to know the gospel Beloved, do you know the gospel? Now, I know you know it enough to become a Christian, right? You're, you're saved if you're a Christian. But do you know the gospel so that on a moment's notice, if God sovereignly opens a door, you could share the truth of the gospel? A believer, a true believer, wants to be prepared and prayerfully looks for opportunities to share the life-transforming truth of the gospel. 1 Peter 3.15 is probably the clearest passage on that where the apostle Peter said, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. And what? Always being ready. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asked you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yeah, with gentleness and reverence. There's an attitude of gentleness, an attitude of reverence, and yet there's a boldness of always being prepared. Beloved, if this afternoon God provided you an opportunity Maybe your neighbor, or maybe a, a child, or, or maybe this week a, a co-worker. There, a, a door was opened for you to share the gospel, and you asked uh, uh, some leading questions to lead into that. Would you be prepared? Would you be prepared to be able to share the gospel clearly enough so they could accept or reject the truth? Are you prepared at a moment's notice? Because the reality is you don't have time in that moment to prepare. That's why Peter says, be prepared um, for that. What is the gospel? I, I just gave it to you. Four points. It's not, it's not complicated. Christ calls us to come as a child, right? A child can come in saving faith. And so we need to be ready with the facts of the gospel. God is holy. People are sinful. Jesus is Lord and Savior. You must believe and repent. That's the gospel. And if you can share that with simplicity, with conviction, say, well, John, that's so simple. That's right. It's simple. But as the Holy Spirit of God empowers that message, people's lives can be transformed. How do you know? Look around you. That's the message that you responded to. Someone either shared that to you or you read a tract or in Scripture. That's what you believed. Are you prepared um, for that? Inside your bulletin, there's a little, little card that looks like this. And you say, that looks familiar. Yeah, that's what I've just been saying the last uh, five minutes. God is holy. People are sinful. Jesus is Lord and Savior. We must believe and repent. I encourage you. Take that card. Alex Repay and uh, Greg Hayner kind of developed this as a tool for us to use. There's some explanation on the back. How can you use this? The first thing way to use this is just use this to become familiar. I mean, for you to say, I need to be able to, to share this, even if I didn't have this, to be familiar with this. It could be also a tool that you could use to go over um, with someone. But whatever you use, be prepared. Always being ready. Always remember, there's a whole bunch of them back in the back, and you can take as many as you want uh, to pass out, to hand out, or to use um, as um, a resource. Be prepared. What's the second implication of this, of verse um, 5? Trust the power of the gospel. And beloved, we need to hear this. Trust the power of the gospel. And I think this will help us. We all admit, uh, most of us, it's a challenge to do I say something now? What's going on? We, there's a fear that begins coming in your heart. 
And one of the major things that will help you in that is trusting the power of the gospel. Beloved, do you really believe that the Holy Spirit can empower your proclamation of the gospel to bring someone to Christ? Do you really believe that? Sure. Paul was an apostle. He's a big A apostle, of course. The Holy Spirit can empower his words. But what about you? Do you really believe? Do you believe that the Holy Spirit can use your words? Imperfect, stumbling, and yet sincere. Can the Holy Spirit use your words to bring someone to Christ? That the triune God can empower your words, as you share the truth of the gospel so that someone would come to Christ. I believe this will help us greatly the more we are convinced of this. Do you want to experience the Holy Spirit's power? You say, yeah, I want the Holy Spirit's power in my life. Well, one of the greatest ways you can do that is just proclaim the gospel because that's where he promises. Probably one of the clearest ways that he promises that he will empower your life. He will graciously and powerfully work. What specific persons at work, what specific persons in your neighborhood will you pray for? And then boldly take appropriate opportunities to share the gospel. So it's going to be awkward. Yes, let's just face it, it'll almost always be awkward when you start, when you jump off the diving board and start that conversation about gospel. That's just the way it is. But then when you get into it, like, why did I hesitate? This is awesome. The Spirit of God is, is working. Will we step out in faith? and believe that God will use your proclamation of the gospel to draw someone to Christ. Beloved, there are few things as exciting and as encouraging as when you see the Holy Spirit use your words, very imperfect, but when he used your words to draw someone to Christ. That's something we need to long for and pray for. With all of our fears and insecurities, pray, oh God, use me in that. But in a room this size, this is actually about you. You have no message to bring because you've not responded to that message. Sure, the, what I just shared with you, you say, I, I know that. I know that God is holy. I know that man is sinful. I know that Christ is Lord and Savior. I, I know that someone must believe and trust in Him. But clearly in a room this size, there are some that have not embraced the gospel for yourself. So my call to you, my cry to you, this passage is crying to you today is the day of salvation. Embrace that message. Come to Christ in faith and repentance so that you, and by God's grace, will have a message um, to share. Beloved, trust the gospel's transforming power. So in this first verse, we've seen the power, the awesome power of the gospel. Let's look secondly at the power of suffering. Look at verse 6. Paul is talking about when they came to Christ, when he went through Thessalonica there. What does he say? Look at verse 6. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you were with us last week, we gave you a little background that Paul wasn't there very long. Maybe a month or two is all that he was there in Thessalonica. And then he was forced to leave because of persecution. And Paul sent back Timothy, and he said, Timothy, uh, we had to leave quickly. How are those new believers doing in Thessalonica? And he sends back Timothy, and, and because he's concerned, because this, these new Christians, they're surrounded by immorality. They're surrounded by idolatry. And what, what's the report that comes back? Timothy comes back, and he says, they're doing great. They are doing well. Their faith is genuine. They were following Paul's examples. Ultimately, they were following the Lord. And how were they imitators of Paul? Paul specifically says, you're imitators of me. Look there in the middle of that verse, verse 6. Having received the word in much tribulation. Having received the word with much tribulation. This word tribulation, it's a word that literally means to press. In my um, shop, in my garage, I have a, a vice that you tighten it up and it just squeezes something. That's the idea of this word, to press or to squeeze or to crush. So the Thessalonian did not embrace the gospel in an easy, comfortable way. This was not something that would appeal to their earthly desires for comfort, ease, and pleasure. Quite the opposite. 
When they embraced the gospel, it was in the midst of much suffering. It was the midst of much struggle. Remember back in Acts 17 when Paul preaches the gospel in the Thessalonian synagogue? What happened? He was there for three weeks, and then the the Jews that were there, they pushed back hard, and they drove him out of the synagogue, and ultimately they run Paul out of town. They chase Paul out of Thessalonica, but that didn't satisfy him. Because Paul went to Berea, the Jews chased him for 50 miles on foot to harass him. And those Jews from Thessalonica, ultimately, they drive Paul out of Berea 50 miles away. And so there's all kinds of persecution and suffering and struggle in the middle of this. And when they went back to Thessalonica, you know that they turned up the heat on the new Christians that were there in Thessalonica. But Paul had warned them of this. 1 Thessalonians 3, 4 says, For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you. He warned them in advance. As he shared the gospel with them, he tells them this. We were warning you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know. And we don't know exactly what the persecution of the Thessalonians was, but certainly it was very harsh. It was um, certainly they were treated harshly, no doubt they were related to their, their work. Uh, they could have lost their jobs. It could have been physical persecution, but it was very strong. And Paul is saying they stood firm in the midst of much suffering and maltreatment. When Paul writes his second letter to them, what does he say? Look at verse 4, 2 Thessalonians 1, 4. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God. For why? For your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is amazing. Like the refining fire for gold, the persecution, it was, like, it was having a sanctifying effect in their lives. It was purifying the believer's faith. So in God's sovereign plan, persecution and suffering is a necessary and normal part of the Christian life. Don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. Don't be stunned. Martin Luther, reformer, once said, Christ was crowned with thorns. Were you expecting roses? Unquote. So true, isn't it? Only Christianity has a God who suffers. Only Christianity has a God who suffers. Only Christianity says your suffering is never meaningless. It's never, you're never on your own. It's never meaningless because God himself suffered for you. And it's never solitary because God himself suffered with you. First Timothy, I mean, 1 Peter 2.21, Peter says, For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. We often talk about we need to follow the example of Christ, but Peter makes it very clear. What's the primary place, even the most obvious place where Christ is an example? It's in suffering. It's in suffering. And for American Christians, this is foreign, foreign to us. The Thessalonians stood firm in their faith. They showed that they're genuine followers of Jesus as they suffered for him. But I love the perspective that Paul gives here on them. This was not just a, a grin and bear it, gut it out for Jesus perspective. Not at all. Look there at the end of verse 6. He said, You became imitators of us and of the Lord. How? Having received the word in much tribulation. Then what does he say? With the joy of the Holy Spirit. What a paradox. Although they're going through much suffering, much tribulation, Paul says they were filled with joy. Some false teachers in our day and age would say that if you become a Christian, you'll, you'll have no more problems. And if you have problems, it's because you just don't have enough faith. But Paul and the Bible say, no, no, no. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life with power, it doesn't mean there will be no suffering. It doesn't mean there will be no affliction. But what it does mean is that you will have unexplainable joy. Unexplainable joy. John Calvin said, you must submit to supreme suffering in order to discover the completion of joy. That it's in the midst of suffering, struggle, that we can experience the greatest joy. We can have a, Christians can have a joy that doesn't have a worldly explanation. It's a joy not because of circumstances. 
It's a joy not because of external. It's a joy because of one reason, because the Holy Spirit has done a work to bring joy into the life of the believer. How is that possible? Because it's the joy from the heart of a person that's been reconciled to God and is experiencing the fountain of joy that comes from the presence of God. The psalmist in Psalm 16 alludes to that when he says, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. Now, does that mean that as a Christian, you'll, you'll have constant 100% joy? No, we live in a, a fallen world. We battle with the flesh. There will be much time where we struggle to embrace that joy, but we can have that joy as we look to Christ and walking with the Lord. So what is the implication from this uh, verse 6? And that is embrace suffering with joy. Embrace suffering with joy. We should be very thankful. Uh, we live with unprecedented freedom from persecution. Unprecedented. Unprecedented uh, geographically, but also unprecedented historically. Just the, the freedoms that, from persecution that we have. God has been so gracious to us. Persecuted Romanian pastor Richard Wormbrand once said, he spent 14 years in prison two or three of those years in solitary confinement in horrible conditions. But he once said, not all of us are called to die a martyr's death, but all of us are called to have the same spirit of self-sacrifice and love to the very end as these martyrs did, unquote. We have different roles different that God has for us, but there should be an underlying attitude. By God's grace, may we have a humble sacrifice and love, even though we aren't right now experiencing violent persecution. I think as we look around us, though, we know there are sober indications that persecution could be coming in the, in the near future. Things it seems like are kind of being set up um, for that to be, but don't give in to fear. Because look at the, the, the Thessalonians. They were joyful when they were in the middle of it. And so we don't need to give in to fear um, for ourselves or anxiousness for our own lives or for our loved ones or fellow believers. God will be faithful. He provided them grace that they needed in those situations. We will, by God's grace, experience joy as we walk with him in that. By grace, he's given us abundance now. We need to now seek Christ to love him. So trust the gospel's transforming power. You see the power of the gospel, the power of suffering. Let's look finally at the power of example. Well, this actually went through all of these verses, but particularly in verse 7. He says, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Macedonia and Achaia, it's, that, it's modern day Greece, that, that whole region. They became an example, even though they've, they've only known the Lord a couple months. But the reputation of the Thessalonian believers spread far and wide to the churches in this whole surrounding region. It's not because they had some kind of PR campaign where they were getting on Facebook and telling everyone how great they were in their Christian walk. No, it was a word of mouth that people became aware. Wow, look what God is doing through those believers in Thessalonica. Their lives have been transformed by the gospel. And it was obvious their reputation by God's grace spread like wildfire. Throughout the New Testament, consistently the Word of God elevates the importance of example. That God would have His people be examples. Philippians 3.17, Paul says, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Christ is our ultimate example. But then that's to be reproduced in His followers that we are to be examples for others. Remember what Paul said to Timothy? Timothy was a young man. He gives him a very uh, encouraging challenge in 1 Timothy 4.12. He says, let no one look down on your youthfulness. How is that possible? How could no one look down on your youthfulness? Rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Our Lord intends to extend his power our Lord intends to extend his influence through people like you, Christians, who are examples, are living pictures of Christ. Beloved, people can't see Jesus, but they can see you. 
Do they see Jesus reflecting in you? That's what Paul was saying. Even though they're young in the faith, they became model Christians. This is a small church filled with baby Christians in a sea of paganism. And yet the Spirit of God enabled them to be a powerful display and a powerful picture of Christ. Christ was being formed in them. And Christ is the starting example. Colossians 1.28, we proclaim him, admonishing every man, teaching man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Christ is our primary example. And you remember Christ, I mean, Paul will tell others, follow me. How should others follow him? Follow me as I follow Christ. Christ is the ultimate example Paul followed, and he desired that then others would follow Christ's example. At the end of verse 5, look what it says there in your text. Just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You saw our example. Then at the beginning of verse 6, Paul says, you became imitators or followers of us in the Lord. Think of this amazing chain. There's a chain of example here. You have Christ. And then Paul says, I followed Christ's example. And then he says, in Thessalonians, you followed our example, those that brought the gospel to you. And then he's saying, now there are other people that are looking back to you, Thessalonians, and they're following your example. What an amazing chain of example that God used for his glory. It's like when you drop a, a rock in a pool of water. What is it? There's a ripple effect that spreads and spreads and spreads. So in a sense, you and I, we are in the, there's a lots of links in that chain between us and Jesus. But we see Paul, the Thessalonians, the people that followed their example, then many, many, many thousands of others. But now we are links in that chain as well, looking back to the examples of others that have followed Christ, but then by God's grace that others would look to us in the example we are of following Christ. So I think a natural implication of this is that you would embrace the power of example. Example. Their example was profoundly used in this whole region. What about you? At your workplace? At your school? In your neighborhood? Do you stand out? Not in a prideful, legalistic way, but... But do people notice? Are you an example of Christ-like love and ministry to others? Is there, is there a consistency in your life that people know he's different, she's different? Are you a person of conviction and integrity because of Christ? What about in your home? In your home itself, are you an example of Christ to the people that are the very closest to you? Is it obvious that Christ is the center of your life? If you're married, does your pursuit of Christ encourage your spouse to pursue Jesus as well? If you're parent, the power here is amazing. It, 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 though not perfect, can your children clearly see Christ reflected in you? Or do you just try to give them a, a Christian impression? Or is there a deep sincerity of faith so that your kids know that, that you love Jesus above all things and you long for them more than anything that they would love Christ? Kids can see through futile attempts just to give a Christian impression. They know the difference and will have devastating effects on their lives. But if by God's grace we will sincerely seek to follow the Lord and, and live for Him, honestly confess our sins to those that we sin against and live the gospel that you teach them, God can use that to have a profound impact like we see in the Thessalonian believers. Beloved, embrace the power of example of your life, your life. It's not just a big apostle's life, your life. God can use your life, your example for his glory. Yes, it's important to teach the truth, to be bold in sharing the gospel. But your example, for good or bad, over a lifetime, that can have an impact far beyond what we can ever imagine. Yesterday, I mentioned this last week, but yesterday we had the, the privilege of going down to Roland Kincher's uh, memorial service down in Moscow, and his life of an example, it was so clear. I mean, person after person giving testimony of God's grace. That's an example of an example, living a life that pointed to Christ. But what about you? in your role that God has given to you, are you living in such a way that people look at you and say, wow, they're not perfect, 
but there's something different about him, her. There's something different about him. I see Christ in their life. They need to see the transforming power of the gospel in your life. So we've seen the power of the gospel. We've seen the power of suffering. And we've seen the power of example. The call of this passage for you is, are you trusting the gospel's transforming power in your life? Roman was a devout Muslim in Kazakhstan. And this man named Roman, he loved to harass Christians more than anything else. And particularly, he took an insidious joy out of harassing former Muslims that had come to Christ. He loved to do everything he can to challenge them. And particularly, during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, he would try to find Christians and, and try to viciously confront them. He attacked them with questions about their faith. He tried to confuse them. He tried to trip them up. He tried to, to make them question their faith. In 2017, during Ramadan, Roman went a step further to express his devotion to Islam. He decided to pay a visit to a local Christian church, and he is determined that he would disrupt it. He would attack those that he considered betrayers of the real faith. He says, quote, I went to the church service during Ramadan because I considered myself to be a devout Muslim. He says, I wanted to prove my faith to Allah. But as the church service began and, and Rowan was sitting there, he and the pastor began to speak and share the truth of God's word. Roman could not force himself to do what he had come there to do. He couldn't bring himself to, to stand up and, and cause a scene and, and attack those Christians that he had hated up to that point. The words that he heard the pastor preaching touched him too much. The Spirit of God powerfully worked through the gospel that was proclaimed. He says, for the first time, I heard about a God who loved me. He says, I never knew the Almighty God loved me, even though I am not perfect. And that love was displayed most clearly when God sent his precious son to die for sinners. And so the, the surprising and, and healing truth of the gospel of a God who loves his sinful creation and sent his son to die on the cross for their sin began to wash away a, a lifetime of guilt. And so the gospel words that Roman heard that day of, of love and, and mercy and forgiveness that he didn't ever hear in Islam. That began to touch his heart. It grabbed his heart. And then something happened that he had never expected in that service. When he walked into that church with very evil intent, the gospel came with the Spirit's power, and he broke down in repentant tears, and he trusted in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. One moment entering into that church to try and uh, decry the followers of Jesus the next, within that hour, he came to Christ. He was overcome with indescribable joy. Sitting there in that church service in Kazakhstan, this man who had devoted his life to persecuting Christians now became one of them. He became a true follower of Jesus. Now that is different from our lives. We aren't experiencing that, but it tells us of the transforming power of the gospel, and it's not a different gospel that you have. It's the same gospel, the same power. Beloved, will you trust in the transforming power of the gospel? Let's pray. Talk to the Lord and in what way specifically would God have you to trust in the transforming power of the gospel? It may be a commitment to say, you know what, actually I'm not that familiar with sharing the gospel. I know if the door opened, I, I wouldn't be able to share that clearly. Maybe it's a commitment to be prepared. What specific persons will you pray for as opportunities to share with them the transforming power of the gospel? And then even following up further, if that gospel can transform and take a sinner and make them a follower of Christ, what about those areas of sin that you are struggling with, that you are managing how would God have you to look at the same transforming power of the gospel and come underneath that power so that, that sin could truly be conquered for God's glory and you could be an example of those who believe? Talk to the Lord.
Father, we praise you for the transforming power of the gospel, most of all because it's transformed our hearts and our lives so that we could be reconciled to you. Our hearts were hard, and yet you opened our eyes to see you, Christ. We came to you in saving faith. I pray that by your grace you would renew and refresh and strengthen our belief in the power of the gospel and that we would trust you to take that gospel to those around us, some very close, some neighbors, some co-workers, some that we don't even, haven't even talked to or met very often, and yet we have an opportunity. I pray that you would use each of us, that we would boldly have opportunities to do that and then see your power at work. And then we trust you that you would use that same power of the gospel to transform those areas of our lives that we struggle with, we battle with, so that we can be examples of you, Christ. We trust you for that. In your name we pray. Amen.